All right. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. We're continuing a series that's very appropriate for these weird, uncertain times. And we're going through the book of Revelation and looking at the end. And the reality is Jesus wins. So no matter how messy things might be today, it's going to get a whole lot better. And that's the message really throughout the entire book of Revelation. In chapter 7, we're going to enter a, a section that's part of one really long vision that John, the author, has been receiving since chapter 4. In chapter 4, he got a vision of God the Father. In chapter 5, he got a vision of Jesus as a lamb. In chapter 6, he had a vision of God's wrath being unleashed on the wicked. And then in the first part of chapter 7 that we looked at last week, he saw probably a prequel, something that probably happened before God's wrath was unleashed, where God had all of those who belonged to him marked out so that they would be protected from his wrath. All of those who suffer the wrath of humans and the evil one are marked out so they don't suffer the wrath of God. And now the vision continues in verse 9. And in verse 9, we get a glimpse of our future. There's a fast forward between verses 8 and 9. And so the marking out happens early on. But now we go to the end, the end of time. And we see a picture that's developed much more in Revelation 21 and 22. A vision of what things look like after everything is over. And this is a very beautiful picture. And I would invite you, um, in honor of God's word, if you're able and willing to feel free to stand as we read. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let's pray. Father, help us to better understand what this passage means. And what role you're asking us to play as we're getting ready for the future that you've prepared for all who love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you. You may be seated. So in this vision that's fast forward to the end of time, John sees a multitude of people. And he doesn't know who these people are. 
And he has a question that he's probably afraid to ask. So one of the elders asks it for him. Who are these people and where do they come from? And of course he doesn't know. That's the question he has. And so he says, I don't know. You tell me. Who are these people? Where do they come from? And then he says this. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. Now we read this passage a lot of people just assume, well, these are only the people who are living at the end. Which, by the way, will be worse than it is now. It's going to get worse. It's going to end badly. Revelation is clear about that. But the assumption is these are just the people living in the last three and a half years or, or seven years of the planet before God calls time out and ends the world as we know it. But that's because we have a misunderstanding of the phrase great tribulation. We think that is a proper phrase for a period of time at the very end but that's not backed up by the rest of the book of revelation that's an assumption we've made in the last 150 years that scripture doesn't support actually the term great tribulation means great distress and it's a reference to something jesus said in matthew's gospel when he talks about a great distress coming upon the world which might have been in reference to the fall of jerusalem but seemed to indicate something later on as well. And Jesus picked it up from the 12th chapter of Daniel when he talks about a distress that is coming on the world. So this is a distress coming on the world, but it's coming on the world in a way in which John's audience is deeply familiar. John's writing this to seven churches in Western Asia Minor at the tail end of the first century. And these people are experiencing all kinds of of suffering at the, at the hands of their neighbors, the local government, and even the federal government. The Roman Empire from the emperor down is persecuting Christians. According to chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches, some people have already lost their lives. John himself is on exile on the island of Patmos. The distress has already started. And it was going to get worse. John told the people in chapters 2 and 3, it's going to get worse, and it did. We know from history that the Roman Empire became more and more intolerant of Christians. And emperor after emperor would come along who would persecute Christians, and there was clearly an attempt in the first few centuries to wipe out Christianity until the time of Constantine. And Constantine gave up because all it did was produce a stronger, larger, more vibrant church. But for many years in the Roman Empire, Christians were persecuted and executed because they followed Jesus. The great tribulation was beginning as the church received this book. And it continues to the present day. Now, it doesn't feel that way. I mean, granted, it's going to get worse at the end, but it's already really bad, just not for you in North America. But if you go to websites like Voice of the Martyrs, you'll discover that it really is bad in a lot of places in this world. And there are Christians who are suffering imprisonment and torture and even death because of their faith. And there are more Christians that have been martyred in the 21st century than the first 1,500 years of the church combined. In many places in the world today, this is a very unsafe place for those who follow Jesus. And it is illegal to share the good news with people of a different religion. But they do it anyway. At great personal risk. Because they know the hope before them. In Revelation 7. So these people from the great tribulation include all believers from the time of John until that worst part of the distress at the very end. That means it includes you and me. So John gets a vision of all of those who belong to Jesus at the very end of time. Which is weird because he's probably one of them. And he sees them waving palm branches which Jewish people did during the Feast of Tabernacles as a way to celebrate. And they're not just singing like, you know, we sang very calmly, you know, and softly a moment ago. They're shouting. They're crying out in a loud voice. They're celebrating. 
because their suffering is over. And they say salvation belongs to our God. Salvation belongs to the Lamb. Because they know their suffering is over. Now, you know, I know that today here in this room, we're not experiencing the same kind of suffering some Christians are. Certainly not like many of those that first heard these words. But we're struggling and suffering with different things. You know, I know this because I spend so much time with people one-on-one or couples and have been for the last 16 years. And, and some of the people I do soul care with go to our church and some don't. But I know the kinds of things people will struggle with. It's just different than what they were struggling with at the time John wrote this. And probably was, there probably was overlap. But I know that some of you are struggling in your marriage. Some of you are married and you find your marriage very unfulfilling. I know this. Jesus hasn't given you permission to leave. And you feel stuck because it feels lifeless, joyless, hopeless, unfulfilling, and yet you're stuck. And you have little hope that it will get better. Others of you, I know this from friends, many of whom don't go to our church, but I know that there are a lot of believers who struggle because their kids have walked away. In some cases, they've walked away from friendship with them as parents. They're so hurt over their upbringing, they've refused to have a relationship. Others are willing to have a relationship, but they've walked away from Jesus altogether. They've entered into a lifestyle that is far away from Jesus. And there seems little hope that they'll ever come back. And I know a lot of parents are brokenhearted over the status of their children whom they deeply love and long to be part of their forever family. And they worry that they may never come home to Jesus. And I know other people are struggling financially in a lot of different ways. Some because of COVID, others because people are nearing the end of retirement or retirement age. They're near the end of their working days. But for, for reasons that are maybe your fault, maybe somebody else's fault, but it doesn't matter. You haven't saved up enough and you can't stop working. But you can't keep doing what you've always done. You have to find something to do that you hate because you can't pay the bills because there just isn't enough money. And so you're forced to keep working while friends are enjoying a life of leisure. You're stuck in dead end jobs, working long past you ever thought you would, not knowing if you'll ever be able to retire. And still others have heard some really bad news from a doctor for themselves or for someone they love. And it's really painful news and it doesn't look good. And it's very discouraging. And you're beginning to wonder if you really believe this stuff. Because either you or someone you love is about to meet Jesus very soon. And your heart is broken. You know, suffering can take a lot of different forms. And some of you are in touch with your suffering today and you're very aware of it. And you may even be grieving with Jesus over the loss of what is and what could have been. And others of you are not in touch with that and you're pushing it away and you don't want to step into the pain and you're trying to avoid mourning and weeping and grieving with Jesus. Perhaps because you're not sure Jesus is grieving or perhaps because the pain just seems too much. But there is all kinds of suffering all around us. And Revelation 7, verses 9 and following tells us this. Jesus will give us all we need. Eventually, Jesus will give us all we need, and he will also remove our suffering forever. That day is coming. The older says in verse 15, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. There's another surprise. First, the lion turns out to be a lamb, 
the lamb turns out to be slain but alive, and now the lamb is a shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God tells us the day is coming when all that you long for will be realized. When everything you desperately hope for and crave will be fulfilled. The day is coming when your brokenness will melt away. And God will fulfill the deepest longings of your heart. And to those who read this and were familiar with the Old Testament, they recognized the voice of Isaiah. In Isaiah 49, he said these words, They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them. And lead them beside springs of water. That is like a shepherd. Isaiah had already told us the day is coming. When God is going to take care of every need that we have. And every longing will finally be realized. And one phrase comes from Isaiah 25. Where God says... Isaiah says about God, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from the earth. The Lord has spoken. That day is coming and that is our hope. Folks, our our hope isn't on anything that's going to happen in November. Our hope is that Jesus is coming back. And when he does... He'll take some tissue and he'll wipe away our tears. And any tears we have after that moment will be tears of joy. Because our suffering will end. Our heartache will be a thing of the past. No matter what we have given up to follow Jesus, no matter what we have lost because we love God, we will get back in space. Because our suffering will be removed forever and ever. But who's suffering? Whose suffering is removed? Who gets to experience this kind of future? Well, he tells us, he says early on that they're wearing white robes. Wearing white robes. That means they're pure. That means the people standing before the throne, this great throng, they're righteous. They're righteous and pure and good because of those are the only people that can stand before God and not die. God's wrath was unleashed on the others. But these can stand before God. They can stand before the lamb and not perish because they have white robes. But how do the robes get white? It's not because they're righteous. It's not because they've earned it, right? They're not good enough in their own deeds. You know this, right? You know you're not good enough, right? I mean, who are we kidding? We're not good enough to stand before God as righteous in his eyes. None of us. But then the clue is down in verse 15. Verse 14. He said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. More more weird metaphors. Right? This is really a weird metaphor. So, you have soiled robes. Yes? You know I know you. Right? You have soiled robes. Yes? So, we take those of us who come to Jesus and are declared righteous are those who come with soiled robes and they have placed them metaphorically in the wash basin of heaven where there's blood from the lamb. Now, normally if you put something soiled in a tub full of blood it's going to come out worse than it went in right icky and useless but this isn't ordinary blood this is the blood of the lamb and the lamb is none other than jesus and so this is a metaphor for faith those of us who trust that Jesus' death conquered evil those of us who believe that jesus died for our sins in our place 
realize that by faith, our soiled robes have been made white. That is, though unrighteous, we have been made righteous in the sight of God based not on what we have done, but what Jesus did for us. That's the only reason that any of us can stand before God as righteous people, declaring his praises for all eternity. It's because God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He made us righteous. And we simply receive that by faith. We receive that by faith. Listen to this. Jesus provides this future to all who trust him to the end. To the end. Those seven churches in Asia Minor who first received this, le- this, this book, these, this letter and the letters in it. They were going through a hard times and some people had already fallen away. Because, you know, it's easy to pray a little prayer one day and say, God, please forgive me for all my sins. But, but did you mean it? Was it real? Did you, did you trade all that you are for all that he is? I mean, anybody can say some words. But the truth is, suffering and hardship and persecution and difficulties all have a way of sifting it out to find out whose faith is real and whose was faux. And already in the seven letters to the seven churches, Jesus had made it very clear that you must persevere to the end. You must trust in me to the end. Who who are the true believers? Those who are still standing at the end. Because we will all fall down, but we will not fall away permanently. We will all fall. But true believers never fall away. They always come back. And they'll be standing in the end. One of my favorites of Aesop's fables is the tortoise and the hare. And I was just talking about this one this past week. And one thing about this is I don't like the wording of the moral of the story, right? Do you guys know the moral of the story, that the the one sentence ending to the tortoise and the hare? What's the moral? So instead he wins the race, right? 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 Right. Is that true? No, that's not true. Slow never wins anything, really. I mean, that's dumb. They should really lose the slow part to that because it's not true. The tortoise does not win because he's slow. Does he? No. He doesn't win because he's slow. Why does he win? Because he perseveres. Because he's undeterred. Because he's not distracted. Because he's steady. Because the hare, on the other hand, gets easily distracted. He stops to take a nap. He, he stops to have a beer. He hangs out with friends. He mocks the tortoise. He's like diverting all over the place. You know, and finally in the end, I think he's taking a nap. He just isn't paying attention. He's easily moved from his goal. But the tortoise, you know, he's not slow. He's going as fast as he can. That's just not very fast. But he's undeterred, right? There's the, there's the finish line, and I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to move. I, I'm not going to get diverted. I'm going to keep moving toward the goal until I get there. He is faithful. And that's a great metaphor for the ones who win the race to the kingdom of heaven. It's not that slow is somehow valued. It's endurance that's valued. Do we continue in our faith or do we get distracted along the way and gosh folks i have known so many friends over the 23 years we've been in tucson so many people i've seen start well i mean really really well but i'm not sure if they're going to finish well because hardship and difficulty distracted them and they moved out of the race for a season is it too late for them Not as long as they have a breath, but I worry. I worry sometimes that people that I've seen start well aren't going to finish well, and it really doesn't matter how you start because the hare started really well. In fact, let's be honest, he started better than the tortoise. He really did. 
If, if all that mattered was how you start, the hare would be in the kingdom of heaven. He would have won the race. But what matters is how you finish. Folks, that's how, what matters. That's all that matters. It doesn't even matter about the first part of the race or the middle part of the race. All that matters is finishing well. And those who trust Jesus to the end, those who never lose hope, those who keep marching on toward the prize, those who are still standing at the end, those are the ones that you will find in the kingdom of heaven. That's who's part of this throng. Those who endured to the end. And will that be you? Only time will tell. I hope so. I hope so. So this is a really big throng. I want to talk about who this throng includes and what's required of us. But before we do, we're going to take our brief intermission for three minutes. So feel free to get up and stretch, and we'll be back in three minutes to finish. All right, if you would go ahead and be seated. So we know that in time, Jesus is going to give us all of the things that we long for. And he's going to remove all of our suffering and wipe away our tears. At least all of those who trust in him fully and trust in him alone for the forgiveness of sins. But this is a really big group of people. Did you notice that? It starts out by saying, after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Abraham's going to be so proud. You know, Abraham was told he would have so many descendants, they would be like the sands on the seashore or the dust of the ground or the stars in the sky, and they would be beyond number. Well, he didn't live to see that, but he's going to be raised to life to see that. And so here's a multitude that no one could count gathered before the throne at the end of time. And look how diverse it is. From every nation, tribe, people, and language. What a diverse group of people. What a beautifully diverse group of people. Abraham was not just the father of a nation, but the father of nations. And a lot of Jewish people, even in the time of Jesus, had a really hard time accepting the fact that God's people is bigger than Israel. That God's forever family includes people from every people group in the world who have not converted to Judaism, who've not become good Jewish folk, but who are spiritual descendants of Abraham, because that's what counts, remember? Not being physically related to Abraham, but coming to God by faith in the Lamb. And so here's this diverse group of people with so much flavor, so many distinctives. It reminds me of stuff I heard years ago when I was young and growing up, and we talked about America's melting pot. Do you guys remember that? Do, do people still talk about the melting pot? I don't even know. Do they still talk about the melting pot? Do they? Look, some of you are shrugging. I don't know. They used to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Write this down. Jesus will gather people from the whole world to be part of his family. The whole world to be part of his family. Can you remember that? Because I'm going to slip to the next one. All right. So on the left, we have a melting pot. And a lot of people thought that's what we would have here in our country. And to some degree, I'm sure it's true. You know, people came from Ireland, Scandinavia, Africa, South America, Asia. People have come here from all over the world. And the idea was, the assumption was, people will come here and they'll drop all of their distinctives from their own culture and their subcultures. And we'll all blend together and just have, you know, one language, um, one set of um, experiences, uh, one set of traditions. And eventually we'll only be American and we'll intermarry and we'll just be monochromatic. Right? One bland nation of people who are all just alike. But that really hasn't happened, has it? Not even close. In fact, what's happened, people who study this stuff, sociologists, I guess, they've said that we're actually more like a salad, which I like better than a melting pot anyway. 
you know, my wife was here at the first service. She like, she's the biggest lover of salads I've ever met. I've never met anyone that loves salad as much as my wife. I mean, she's like part rabbit. She could eat, she could eat salad, at least two meals, probably three meals a day. She could eat nothing but salad the rest of her life and be fine. Now, I don't like salads that much, but I do like a good salad. And I like salads with lots of color and flavor, right? I like a little jicama in there. Do you guys even know what that is, jicama? Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Tomato. I love tomato. Some people don't like tomatoes. I love tomato. I love um, a little feta cheese, maybe. Cheese for sure. Um, nuts, maybe some sunflower seeds or, or sliced almonds. You know, you got to have some of that. And maybe even a little bit of citrus. That can be good, a little orange, a little mandarin oranges maybe. I don't know. Just lots of stuff. Like I like a lot of stuff in my salad. I like to go through a line and just put lots of stuff in it. And then I don't drown it in dressing like most people. You know, most people, the salad is just a way to get the dressing in their mouth, really. I mean, that if we're honest. I think for most of my family members, it's just a ranch spoon, Right, that's all that the salad is. But not to me, I like the taste of salad, so I just drizzle a little olive oil on it because I like the flavor of the salad. And you know what? Apparently so does Jesus. Because when we get to heaven, it's gonna be a salad, not a melting pot. The distinctiveness is still there. And that's what brings flavor, right? You know, early on when we started this church, uh, we reached a couple. He was in the Air Force, and he met his wife in the Philippines, and so she's a Filipino-American, and she moved here, and she found all the other Filipinos. Like, I don't even know how they do that, right? This is like the internet was still young, but they found each other. Somehow, the Filipinos, they, I think it's because there are Filipino grocery stores, aren't there? And, you know, that's where you just, that's the connection point. But they, they, just, they know everybody. She had this whole Filipino broader family of people she never knew before. But they all find each other in Tucson because they have that in common. And they remain somewhat a part of their own culture. They don't lose it. We had a couple also a few years later in our church, a Hawaiian couple. Um, both had, had met each other in Hawaii, got married, moved here, still loved Hawaii. Um, and they found all the other Hawaiians in Tucson. They found each other. And they hung out together, did stuff together. And I even hung out at some of their stuff and went to a luau with them. And it was really strange, but cool, right? Really awesome to experience somebody else's culture. And they were very proud of this culture. Very proud. People are often proud of their own distinctive subculture. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think that's what heaven is going to be like. It's going to be this place full of life, full of distinctives, full of flavor, because we all come Looking and being different. And apparently, Jesus loves variety. And he doesn't want everybody to be the same. And so, I, I underlined this when I was in high school. This is my high school Bible. And I underlined this because I thought it was so amazing that heaven's going to be more diverse than the UN. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? So what does that require of us? What does this mean for you and me now, today, right here? Because this is the end. How shall we now live, right? How then should we live? Well, our role is simple, right? If you're still breathing, if you still have a heartbeat, if you're on this planet, then your role is real simple, and that's to share the message of hope about Jesus with the people around you. As long as we're still here, Share this message to bring as many people home as possible because we want our forever family to keep growing until Jesus says time's up. And you know what? Time's not up until the last child comes home. God's not closing that door before the last son or daughter comes in. So what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? I've shared this story before, but it's worth repeating because I really love this. Uh, many of you know that I'm a big fan of Billy Graham. Uh, you know, Graham's name is actually William Graham Ganey. Billy Graham. I love Billy Graham. He's one of my favorite people. He just died in the last year. Uh, he was a great evangelist for many years. He's, he's preached to more people than any other human being ever. And uh, early on, though, he, went, he was going in a different direction than he ended. Okay? He was going in a certain direction, and he really had to choose between two role models 
Now, the one in the middle is a guy named D.L. Moody. And the one in the bottom right is an evangelist, a very popular evangelist in the early 20th century, whose name was Billy Sunday. Now, Billy Sunday liked to wear white suits, and he was flamboyant. You know, he's like crazy, which, by the way, so was the young Billy Graham. Very flamboyant. Uh, quite an entertainer. And he was really imitating Billy Sunday. The problem is, one of the things that Billy Sunday was known for was wedding religion and politics. And in his tent meetings, Billy Sunday would talk not just about Jesus, but what was going on in the political realm, and he would push ideologies and candidates. Initially, Billy Graham followed the same role model. He was just like Billy Sunday. And someone pulled him aside and said, Billy, I really think you should reconsider having Billy Sunday as your role model. They said, you know, the problem with Billy Sunday is even though he was very popular, loved by many, and a very powerful communicator, he turned off a lot of people by the way he talked about politics. And there's a whole group of people that Billy Sunday was never able to reach because they didn't like his politics. This person said, Billy, I fear that if you keep going down this road, you're going to be just like Billy Sunday, and half the population will never listen to a word you say because they've already turned you off. And this person said, you know what? I would challenge you to consider making D.L. Moody your role model instead. D.L. Moody was also a famous evangelist from the early part of the 20th century. But he wasn't as polarizing as Billy Sunday because he never got into politics. Dwight Moody just wanted people to fall in love with Jesus. So he majored on the majors. And he made Jesus his ambition and his topic and his only concern. And nobody hated D.L. Moody. And this person said, Billy, be D.L. Moody. Don't be Billy Sunday. Well, he thought about it. He prayed about it. And he decided to go in that direction. At one point in his life, he actually got behind Nixon big time. And when Nixon fell, it was shameful for Billy Graham because he had been seen with him so often, called him a friend. They had become confidants. But Billy never saw the side of Nixon that came out in the Watergate tapes until they came out. And he was humiliated. And he made it his ambition from that moment forward to never make it about politics or persons ever again. And one reason he was a confidant to so many presidents was because he no longer cared what party or politics they held. And that kept every door open. So here's the invitation for us. One of the longings of my heart is I have always wanted to be safe. Not always. Gosh, that's not even true. More and more over the last seven years. I've just wanted to be safe for everyone. There are people that are far to the right of me on COVID stuff. And I really just don't care if you are. Like, I don't care. Some of you are way to the left of me on COVID. And I really don't care. Big whoop. Like, I don't really care where you are. I, I just love people. I, I don't want to make my opinions about COVID to somehow create a rift between me and another person. I just don't. It's not worth it. And politics... I'll be honest with you, okay? We're only, what, a few weeks out from a national election. Um, I really don't care who you're voting for for president. I mean, honestly, I'm being honest. I just don't even care. Some of you are like, well, I'm not even voting. Well, I don't care if you're not voting. Like, I don't care. If you're not voting or if you are voting or who you're voting for, I really don't care. Because in 500 million years as we stand before the throne of God, nobody's going to care. But how, who won in the United States in November of 2020? No one's going to be talking about that. No one's going to care. Because it's just not that important. I want to be safe. And here's my question. Are you safe? 
Do people who see things way different from you feel like you're safe or are you a cactus? Are you a prickly? Are people like, I don't know about her or he kind of gives me the, the reality is when people look at you, do they feel like you're someone they can come and trust? You know what? I have rich conversations with people who probably don't agree with me anything politically and maybe they know it and maybe they don't, but who cares? It doesn't really matter, does it? I, I want to be safe for people who don't agree with me on stuff because I eventually want to be really unsafe, right? Because eventually I want to share the good news. I want to invite people to Alpha. I want to invite people to Sundays here. I want to share the good news. I want to tell people how Jesus changed my life. Here's the reality. If you're going to be polarizing and you're going to make enemies, make enemies because you love them. Make enemies because you dare to believe that Jesus died for them. Make enemies because you believe God loves them and wants them in the kingdom of God forever and ever. If you're going to make enemies, make enemies because you love them enough to tell them they don't even have to earn their way in. Jesus has already done everything necessary to make them right with God. All they have to choose to do is trust. If you're going to make enemies, make enemies because you love people. Not because you're prickly. Not because you're offensive. Not because you're always hurting people's feelings. Not because you have to be right. If you're going to make enemies, make enemies because you love people enough to risk the friendship for the well-being of the friend for all eternity. Be safe so you can risk being really unsafe in a beautiful way. Are you doing that? If you're not safe, I would invite you to move there. If you are, I would invite you to step out and take risks. Because the only reason we're still here is because some of the father's children haven't come home yet. Don't forget that. Let's pray. Father, help us not to get distracted by so many things around us. And by the things that discourage us and weigh us down. Father, help us to keep Jesus the main thing. Help us to love people like you do. And to hold out our hope, not in the things this world offers, but in what you offer. The forgiveness of sins that leads to a world with no more tears and no more brokenness. And no more pain. Father, help us to remain faithful to the end. And to bring as many people home as we can. While we still have time. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen.